Seventh study session for City Council. Uh, a couple of notes. Uh, the Mayor Brinkman will not be here tonight, as well as the City Manager will not be here tonight. We do have the Deputy City Manager, as well as the uh, City Attorney and the Community Development Director with us. Uh, a couple things, Council, on the calendar uh, for our next meeting Tuesday. We're starting at 6 o'clock. Okay, 6 o'clock. That's where we're having a training session with the so we're going to go over the uh, liability training and also the protocols and legislative rules. So that's going to run from 6 you know, until about 7.30, hopefully around 7.15 so we get, get up. But then after that, we will have our regular meeting at 7.30. Is that like a study session before the regular meeting? It's considered meeting? a study session, but it's a training session. Okay. So, but that will run from 6 o'clock, so be here, don't miss it. And then the regular meeting will start at uh, 7.30. Okay. I do believe that's it. Then tonight we have two items on our agenda. One is about the sign codes, which will be presented by both Jocelyn and Steve. And the second one will also be presented by them as well. Let's see. Where is the sign code? Oh, on the, um, the code related to the planned development overlays. Cool. All right. I hand the floor over to you guys. Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council, thank you. Uh, we're here tonight to talk about the sign code. And uh, you have in the packet uh, potential amendments to the sign code. And yes, it's a 43 page long document. <laughs> uh, the reason for that is our sign code is a very long sign code. And I want to sort of work from the big macro perspective and then uh, work down into a bit of the detail. Middleton has a very unusual sign code. Right? Sign codes in jurisdictions across the country, including the state. I have only come across one city that has the sign code as part of the building code. And that's this city. No other city does. Why? Because signs are a land use regulatory function. They are not a building function. If you were to read our sign code, you would actually, in most cases, have to get both a building permit and a sign code permit. This makes absolutely no sense. Uh, most signs don't have electrical functions. They don't have structural functions. Some do. And in those cases, you do have a building inspector involved as part of the permitting process. But signs are generally uh, regulated through the planning process. And in fact, in most places, you can actually have customized zoning districts that include the sign package as part of the zoning district. Someday we will get there. But right now, the first thing that we do need to address and we're going to be recommending to you is that we really need to move the sign code over into Chapter 10 of the City Code, which is the zone the land use code. If I'm an applicant, I would have no idea that the city even had a sign code because I wouldn't find it in the place where I'd look for it. So that's the sort of the big picture perspective of that. Now, the next part of this that comes up is, is that I, in last year the council did ask the staff to allow for temporary A-frame signs. And the instruction that you gave us was that yes, those could be allowed, provided recognizing the sidewalk is an Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, accessible facility, it cannot block the sidewalk. Now, generally, for ADA accessibility purposes, we have to have a 42-inch clear zone. 
So sometimes we have a five foot sidewalk, we have tree boxes, we have fire hydrants, we have steps, we have a whole host of things on that sidewalk that we can't interfere with. And we will have places where we won't have the 42 inch clear zone. It physically doesn't exist. In those cases, the A-frame sign will have to be placed against the building. Now there is a permit requirement here so that we can go out and tell a property owner, listen, here's where you can put it that meets ADA accessibility standards and here's where you can't put it. And so we are going to be incorporating that in this uh, proposed draft. A second area that we became aware of, and again right now our sign code doesn't address, is mules. And murals can be very, very beautiful things. They can be great pieces of art. You go across Europe and other places, they can be uh, very good pieces of art. They can also be a sign. And they can also have some of the same characteristics and needs to be regulated as a sign does. And this proposed draft incorporates the regulation of murals. And again, we're not going to get into content because the Supreme Court has already made that abundantly clear. We don't look at content. We don't look at what's on the sign. We look at uh, the characteristics of the sign in terms of lighting, in terms of how it impacts uh, various uh, adjacent uh, businesses, but we don't look at the content. Another area that we're going to propose uh, in this ordinance is Many times fast food restaurants have um, menu board signs. Again, very common, very necessary. Currently, right now in the code, there is no regulation. If I'm a uh, McDonald's, I could do a menu sign as big as that wall over there. And um, it might be really obstructing the building and it might be really a very negative uh, impact, but the code doesn't address it we propose to incorporate provisions to address it. Another area that we propose to uh, incorporate provisions that we've not addressed is the lighting along roof lines of buildings that's designed to enhance signage. I can think of a well-known uh, custard shop that has uh, lighting along, and we won't mention who, um, roof lines along the building, and it's designed to enhance the signage. But, under the current code, they don't have to get a sign permit or even come in and talk to us. Again, what we want is, we're not saying that's a bad thing, but we want it to be done in a way that's compatible with the development. The language regarding enforcement appeals. Uh, as a lawyer, I read it. I tried to figure out how it actually worked. And I would tell you, I struggled with it. And if I'm the city attorney struggling with it, I think about what does an applicant do have to do with it. If I'm struggling with it, uh, we are proposing to basically delete it and replace it. We've looked at a number of other cities, Aurora, and uh, for example, that have far more workable language, far more functional language, that if I'm an ordinary person, I can look at it and actually know how the city's going to abate my sign. And so we propose to um, address that as well. Now in this long draft, you will note that, uh, that we do this in legislative style, which is new text is always indicated by uppercase. And so wherever you saw new text, uh, you'll see it by uppercase. Text that's going to be deleted is indicated by strike -up. And so, um, you will see strikeout. And for example, if you were to go to uh, page, uh, uh, five, you'd see a new definition for mule. And you'll see it's all double underlined and in um, uppercase. That's because that's a new definition proposed to be added to this code <coughs> versus, uh, the uh, fact that there's no definition right now. You will note throughout the code you see uh, references to the building official or building permits deleted and it's rather just a permit. 
what should happen is in virtually every other city I'm familiar with, you get a sign permit, and then if there's building inspection and building code things needed, that is incorporated into the sign permit. Uh, we have reviewed this with the building official, and Mr. Tracy has no desire to be in the sign regulation business. Uh, with the exception of when you need to also get to yeah, unless it's a structural or electrical, structural or electrical, then in the building codes it would be regulated, and you yes. would have to get the subsequent um, approval through that venue. Just and we've also clarified some other things, and if you in the code, for example, uh, one of the big things that and this is a problem everywhere. I've never been in a jurisdiction. Everyone loves to use the flag as a sign. Um, particularly car dealerships, I don't think that there's ever an American flag too big for a car dealership. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that is, uh, we understand that's political speech, but on the other hand, we sometimes will get uh, businesses that want to use every conceivable flag under the sun, and uh, including flags of, uh, that have are just flags. And so we defined what a flag is, because our code really didn't clearly define what a flag is. And uh, so we addressed those issues. And so all the way, I'm happy to go through every single page and every single change. The big thing that uh, I really want to focus on is, is A, we're proposing to bring this into the, the zoning code. B, what we've tried to do here is, is clarify the definitions. Um, C, we've tried to address things that we hadn't addressed, like menu signs, illuminated lightage, um, temporary signs. Um, and then, uh, if you, uh, <coughs> or we attempt, attempted to address the sandwich board signs in the way that uh, the uh, council requested us to do. And uh, finally, uh, we attempted, we looked at this and attempted to address the abatement and enforcement uh, process because the current code uh, simply, uh, it simply doesn't work. And we attempted to create a process that is workable. And finally, uh, we, I would tell you the code was amended in 2015 to deal with the Reed case. And for those of you who are not familiar, there was a U.S. Supreme Court case called Reed versus Town of Gilbert. And Town of Gilbert is in Gilbert, Arizona. Very, very familiar with this case. Uh, I've spoken on it a number of times to professional groups. Uh, basically, Gilbert had a sign code that regulated signs based on their content. And... Uh, all of us in the legal community looked at this and said, this is a terrible case to go to the U.S. Supreme Court. <laughs> and it did, and the U.S. Supreme Court said, listen, you, if you're regulating signs based on what's on the sign, that violates the First Amendment. Now, some people have said, oh, well, this means that uh, you can't regulate signs at all. No, that's not what we said. Justice Alito, in the opinion, wrote that I have no problem with traditional regulations of signs pertaining to lighting, size, uh, location. Those have nothing to do with the content on the sign. My problem is with looking at the content on the sign. So the city code, uh, when Ken Feldman was the acting city attorney, was amended. It is, uh, as Reed is concerned, the code uh, meets the requirements of Reed. Uh, I am fully satisfied with that. I don't see any issues with that. I just see a number of issues with making this code actually work uh, so that an average person coming in and seeking a sign permit would know, A, where's the code, what does it say, and um, that uh, both the staff as well as the applicant um, are able to uh, have a code that we can work with. Now, uh, with that, uh, I'd be happy, uh, Council Member uh, Cole mentioned a couple of things about political signs. Uh, we, 
I am going to go back in and make sure that we have a definition for what a political sign is. Now, normally we would not have the uh, standards for that in the definitions. That's in the actual text of the code. But we will add that <coughs> and we will modify uh, and make sure the new definition uh, can be read both plural or singular. Now, one other thing that it was, in fact, Councilman McCall mentioned this, and you see this in this code. You're probably thinking, <coughs> what are they thinking? You'll see us use the term over and over, buildings of structures. Now, I have to tell you, the ordinary reasonable person would think a building is a structure. That is completely true. The only folks who seem to have a problem with this are judges. <laughs> and I do not understand why, but I've actually had the uh, misfortune to mitigate uh, cases where judges tell me that a building and a structure are not the same thing, and a building is not a subset of a structure. I don't understand how they get there, but they do. So what we've attempted to do in this code is to make sure we've addressed both buildings and structures. So if we get this situation where we have a judge who is convinced that a building is not a structure, we can point to it and say, well, we're regulating both. Uh, it's more of an abundance of caution on the lawyer's part, but having had to argue that very point before, uh, it, I would not want to have to do that again. So with that, uh, I am pleased to answer any questions that you have. Uh, that because this uh, is technically not a zoning case, it wouldn't normally go to the planning commission, but because we're proposing to put it into the uh, zoning code, we will be doing what we'd call a courtesy study session with them to review this with them. And then it would come back, assuming council so has a consensus, to a first read to the council, and then ultimately a second read. Uh, and additional community outreach as well. And additional community outreach as well. This is the type of ordinance we would meet with the local chamber. We would uh, let sign companies know about it. We would even let uh, any of the zoning practitioners know about it. And uh, basically, which we would do on other types of similar uh, code provisions. I would tell you it is my recommendation, my strong recommendation to the council that we do need to proceed in this direction. We need, uh, we need to have a workable sign code. We need to have a sign code that fits into the zoning code, that down the road, one of the things that the council at study session talked about was our lack of connectivity between our codes and our plans. Honestly, this is a perfect example of we have this code over the building code. It really is a land use function. It's not connected. This is really carrying forth one of those things that the council talked about, which is how do we make things more connected. And this is taking a small step, but a step in that direction. And so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Council Peggy. Yeah, so. And just a reminder that we're scheduled to, to wrap this one up at 8. Start at uh, 7.15. So the portable thing that we already talked about, as you talked about it just now, three more things came to mind. Um, could this... Does, does the portable yes. section there include a pole, a roof, um, and... Mind that might be in a lot of people's yards. Um, and I can't think of it right now. But, um, because the portable signs would be defined in this code uh, as a sign that's it's not permanently affixed to a building. It could be a sandwich board sign. Now, conceivably, it could be some other kind of portable sign. And what we've attempted to do there is. <coughs> Like the portable sandwich board designs to require a, a special permit, and the idea there was we wanted to make sure that those signs, uh, we did the analysis of um, for ADA purposes. Is, is a roof considered part of a building? Roof? Yes. So it's, it's all encompassing for building. Okay. And then if someone, now I know you're not supposed to put stuff on, utility poles, but some people do. 
there are poles, big poles that some people have in their yards or along their yard. Generally, we're going to treat that as a violation. We don't. You're not permitted to put signs on the utility poles, whether they be <coughs> utility poles or XL utility poles. Some people have poles in their yards for other flagpole. They don't. A flagpole, uh, in terms of they want to fly a flag, that would be uh, fine if they were to, basically if they were to put a sign on a flagpole, that is what we would call First Amendment speech. Uh, I like Trump. I don't like Trump. And they want to put that on a flagpole. We cannot prohibit that or regulate that. Now, if they were to start putting portable commercial signs, go shop at... Uh, Apple Store and Aspen Grove. That we can regulate. That's now a commercial sign, and we would regulate that. But just signs that are political signs, like on a flagpole, we would not. So it would depend on, and we're not looking at the content of that sign. We're just saying, okay, the Supreme Court has said political speech uh, is protected by the First Amendment, but commercial speech doesn't have the same protection under the First Amendment. It has a lesser protection. So if it looks like commercial speech, we're not getting into the content. We're just saying it's commercial speech, and it doesn't have that same protection. So these, sorry. Go so these signs are for commercial signs, not for anything a resident would do that's not commercial. You know, to put up a, you know, like you said, a. Yes. We're not looking like if people uh, have signs in their windows. Right, right. Uh, we're not getting into that and, uh, because, again, those are generally uh, protected by the First Amendment. Now, if you put a sign in your window that is truly a commercial sign, it's flashing neon and uh, it's advertising a business, now th that becomes different because it's not really, again, that same political speech sign. You're basically putting a commercial sign in your window to advertise a business. Which gives me a question about the off-premise. Would that be considered the off-premise sign where... Yes, if it was not for the business located on that site, that was an off-premise sign. And again, we didn't have a definition in our code for off-premise, which is really unusual. I, <laughs> to be honest, I've not seen a site code that didn't define off-premise signs. But we again proposed to add that in here because we really need to have a definition for off-premise. So that off-premise, the word not there kind of through me, it's offering a location other than the premises that contains the business products or services not sold or offered to the public. So that as that that off-premise location, there are no goods sold yes. there, but they are promoting a separate business where you those can okay. You have a neon sign in your house. You're not selling anything, but you're promoting a store at Aspen Grove. Right. Okay. Patrick, did you? Yep. Uh, so this is will be broken out from uh, our building codes. Yes, yep. this, would, this would go into the zoning code. It would actually become a new uh, section 10-17 in the zoning code. And uh, you would uh, actually, it would be the last uh, chapter in the zoning code. And quite honestly, uh, I do think in the future we have at least one other code will be coming back to you and wanting to do the same thing, but that's a bit down the road. And that's, again, in this city, historic preservation codes are a zoning function. They're not a building code function. And, and then, um... And that would eventually, we're proposing that we will someday, we're going to be back here to talk about that, too. And then the uh, sandwich board sign, since that's uh, real important to getting the people down in uh, downtown. Yes. Um, is that a yearly permit or a monthly permit? Or? That would be an annual permit. Annual permit. permit. Okay. The idea there would be, because sometimes circumstances do change. A good example is right now we have a lot of trees downtown. Right. We have a few of those trees that are dying. And one of the issues that comes up is, it may be that in that particular location, for whatever reason, you can't properly irrigate it. It may not be the right site to have a tree. It may need to be somewhere else. Well, if it does, and that suddenly frees up more accessible space, that could change the permit in a subsequent year. And so we have to be able to look at that because those things are never fixed in concrete, so to speak. This. They, they move, they change. You said it's 42 inches for ADD, ADA, or? 
Wait, 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 for each half. For each half. Yep. Okay. And so, uh, I would tell you, I mean, the biggest difficulty we do have downtown is we don't have, in front of our businesses, a huge amount of sidewalk space. It, it, it is what it is. We just don't. And it's very, so we, that does create <coughs> difficulties because of being the ADA requirements and we're still trying to respond to this community need. I think we have given you a proposal that does both. Jocelyn staff has been extensively involved. I think we went through, what, eight or nine drafts of this? Mm -hmm. uh, where we would go back and forth and say, okay, this is the lawyer's view. Now, what do the planners think? And the planners would go, no, I'm a lawyer. You don't know this. This is, you're trying to be a planner. Now, let's do the planning. And so they would do it, and I'd go back and say, now you're trying to be lawyers. And I would read it, and I would say, Steve, I don't know what you just wrote. And so it went back. Is there a way those trees... Wait, I think Prenna, did Sorry. you want to chime in there? Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so on the permit process, is there a fee associated with yes. this? <laughs> what the uh, sandwich board, what we said is, is that the... Um, there could be a fee that would have to be established by council. And what, uh, if that was to happen, where I think that will probably happen is, as you're aware, we are doing a cost of service study. And that's where normally you would establish this kind of fee. You would say, okay, how much time does it take to do a permit for a sandwich board sign? If it takes half an hour and the cost of staff time is $20, 20 divided by half, $10. That's the whole purpose of the cost of service study is, is to, we will give you on that study, uh, essentially, here's the maximum supportable fee. And you don't have to go with that fee. You could say, well, this is a community benefit. We want to cut this fee down uh, to $5. Okay, so it's not established yet, but it would be something that would come forward. Right now, we do, and I'm sorry I didn't bring that, that structure, but we do have a sign permit fee, and then we do have a fee for, like, portable temporary signs, which is different. So if we like a banner or something like that, we have a structure and the sandwich board signs would come under that fee. And I can't remember, the, but it's much less than the actual um, sign permit for a permanent sign attached to a building. And then um, the, you talked about the, uh, one of the items was fast food. You, sp yes. you specified fast food restaurant menu. Um, is it necessary to specify fast food because it can really happen for any restaurant? Well, it really is more of what we have as, as a drive-through menu. It's more for the drive-through menu. That's what the intention is, yeah. to specifically call out for when, for restaurants that have a drive-through component, mm -hmm. the signage that can be allowed for that drive-through. We have fairly elaborate drive-through structures. Yeah, so we just want to make sure that they are functional, but fit within parameters so that it's not like five menu board signs that are as big as the, and the so freestanding I didn't, sign. I didn't, read, I didn't read through this in that level of detail, so is it more specified in the actual code that it's intended for drive-through? Yes, and we can <laughs> further look at that again, but it was intended for the drive-through. Yeah. Yes, yeah. because conceivably some restaurants, and again, to just use examples, Denny's, IHOPs, uh, generally will have drive throughs We don't necessarily think of them as fast food, but we would have the same concerns with a drive through a Denny's that had a wall like this as a yeah. drive through menu, as we would with a uh, fast food restaurant. So, so, Steve, is it true that they can have... There was no limit to have the number of menu boards either, so you could see yes. them lined up multiple <laughs> ones. You could have them. So there was you no wanted. limit to size or number, so there could have been somebody coming in with five of them if they wanted sure. to. And then my final, I, I didn't, uh, the regulation on murals as signs, so I didn't completely understand that. So we're going to put, when a mural is used as a sign to promote the business, that's when reg this regulation kicks in, not a mural that's artwork. Yes, I mean, the goal here is, is that sometimes I've seen businesses that uh, will use a mural and they'll incorporate artistic uh, things in it, but then they'll also include the commercial advertisement for the business. That's what we're aiming at is um, murals is art, and I understand art is truly near the beholder, but murals that have a non-commercial, they're art, they may be commemorating an aspect of Milton history, or they're commemorating an aspect of Colorado history. That's not what we're trying to regulate here. But uh, I have seen 
many from you all that uh, may have some historical commemoration to it, but it's also advertising the commercial business. And so that would not be allowed, is that what you're saying? Or you would regulate it like you would regulate it as a permanent process. And would that be considered a permanent sign because it's permanently affixed? Yes. Yes. Cool. Carol. Um, I, I looked through the um, temporary signs and I didn't find this and, and I realize it very well might be there. For realtors who put uh, the A-frame signs on sidewalks, um, like along Broadway, is, um, is, is that something that would be in here? I don't think it's ever permitted, but I was wondering if, if, if it said that it's not permitted. And if there's a penalty for realtors who do it persistently, those would generally be defined as a uh, a temporary sign, and uh, they uh, they are permitted, but we have limits on both uh, the uh, square feet and the maximum height. And uh, now, if they're election signs, and this is where we treat temporary signs whether they be real to science or election science, all is the same. Because the, the, this is where Reed comes in and says, you can't pick temporary events and treat them but really. Where, where so are you? It would be the new section 10-17-6-6. You'll see that uh, we have a whole series of uh, temporary sign definitions. And one of the things we try to do is we uh, address both the sandwich board signs there, temporary signs, and then you'll see developer direction signs, which uh, many realtors use as well, and we address those things. Right, so uh, I, 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 I'm trying to ask a question about you. And so the realtor signs, we would address those as temporary signs, they would be permitted, but uh, they would have to go ahead and they would have to be. Um, Carol, are you, re are, you, are you referring more to like an open house sign for realtors? It's, and those are usually yes. treated as off premise signs, and those aren't allowed in most codes. They, they are, are not allowed. Not treated as in off premise signs, yes. That's yes. Yeah, the open house or the, the weekend. The the block, yes. the block or so I don't. Steve, how did we treat those in our code? Normally, they're considered an off premise sign, and they're not allowed. They're, they're what? An off-premise sign. Yeah. Off-premise, like and they are not allowed. Well, I don't, I don't know what well, yeah. we're doing. We can, let's have us look at that in a little more detail and understand what you guys are saying and just yeah. make sure that we are creating that structure about what... The, the situation I'm trying here. to address is I've worked with Rebecca um, with uh, uh, realtor uh, signs on the sidewalk along Broadway. And um, they're, they're really in the way. They're intentionally put where they will be seen sometimes in the street. I, and, um, and then we have the same realtors doing it again and again and again and again. And, and apparently there's no penalty for their doing that. With them being on the sidewalk, they wouldn't the have 42 inch clearance anyway. Yes, oh, no. So, no yeah, that would not be. What most codes yeah. I'm used to would be on the sidewalk is not permitted because, again, the sidewalk's an ADA accessible yeah. facility. They would be permitted off the sidewalk, like on a post or whatever, but only for the duration of the event. If you're doing an open house on Sunday, they'd be permitted for that day, but you couldn't have them up. Uh, and this is the same, and this is what got Gilbert into trouble. Gilbert had one rule for real estate signs. They had a different rule for church signs. Real estate signs could be up the whole day on Sunday. Church signs can only be up for two hours before the service and one hour afterwards. And they distinguish it solely on the basis of what was on the sign. Steve, also I think we're, we're talking about a realtor sign that's, that's announcing an open house down the block or something that's on the corner. Yes, so that's an on-premise that. sign normally. Right. And, and we also have church signs. Yeah. Large church signs, A-frames that are put on the sidewalk. And we can address the sidewalk. That's an easy so thing to address. So the sidewalk is okay. The, uh, the other places, what we just want to do is to stay consistent with Reed, is we're going to set the same time frames for everything. It will be usually what I'm used to will be uh, the day of the event, uh, not more than, for example, two hours before and two hours after. It doesn't matter whether it's a church or real estate or whatever. Yeah, sure. It's all the same, but they can't be on the sidewalk. 
that okay. just, you were asking about enforcement and penalty with that. Yes. Yeah. It, yeah. Is there a penalty? And yeah, well, there, there will be, once this is adopted, we will have a workable penalty where we can actually notify the uh, person in violation. We can either remove the sign or uh, if they, uh, if necessary, we can impose uh, a cost which includes uh, a collection fee. We also will have provisions in here that will allow the court to impose fines uh, should the person continue to violate. Right now, the we issue, have good. The issue is, if let's say it's on a Sunday, nobody in the city is available to go out <laughs> Thank there. Thank you. That is true. I mean, that is that that came up several years ago. Same with so, the realtor um, signs, Saturday. Right, so they're always on the weekends. Yeah, they're always on the weekends. And that's something where, again, now, presuming, I don't want to sort of get into the city manager's area, but in many cities, what they'll do is that they'll reschedule work hours to where they'll have maybe the code person go out on a Saturday and just do Saturday signs. And again, that's a city manager process, but certainly there are things like that we can do. Once we clean up the code to make it super clear for everyone what the rules are, and once we get that piece done, and I think we'll make it Jerry, I'd like to get in line again. Sure, I think Kyle's up next. Kyle's up, okay. then Karina's up, then I'd like to get up again. Chance here after. All right, let's see. Um, I had, uh, so with the flags, it was all political designations of flags. What about sports teams or things like that? Would that be counted? I mean, I realize that you could say that's a First Amendment, yeah, but if it's... We, sports flags, we would treat those as a sign. Okay. What we wanted to do is we wanted to deal with uh, political flags. We don't want to regulate those as a sign because those, um, again, the courts have said those are First Amendment speech. The, the Gadsden flag, the one that has the snake saying, don't tread on me. Yeah. That's political speech, uh, and we don't want to get into regulating that. On the other hand, as much as I love the Broncos, and I've developed a great love for the Broncos in the last year. Uh, <laughs> Wise. <laughs> uh, well, they put them out one of the Cardinals. Um, <laughs> but um, the uh, fact is that we would treat as a sign because that isn't, it isn't political speech. Yes, you're expressing your loyalty to your sports team, but whether it's the Broncos or the Avalanche or uh, the Colorado Rapids, they're not, that's, that's not political speech. It's, it's, is it same or is it, because Peggy hasn't had a chance to okay. Yeah. So I'm back on maintenance. Yes. One of the things that I think makes a place look trashy is if the lighted sign maybe has multiple pieces of light and part of it's burned out. And I think a sign, if it's lit, needs to have whatever lights were designed to be on it function. So you're not like Jimmy Fallon and he goes around and finds works that are like half <laughs> lit up. So you know, like <laughs> lit, you know, wall instead of Walgreens. And you just show Arby's them. Uh, for hire sign that had no vowels and they used it with that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's as important as um, being in good structural condition and so forth. Like I think working that's, order or something too? Or? I think that's a very valid point. I mean, if you have a sign that half the lights are out, it, it yeah, does That's usually addressed in, in the sign code, because that's usually a sign that's either on its post or in front of a building and normally yeah. mm -hmm. issue a sure. sign permit, that's part of the maintenance of that. So. Wherever that falls in the code, you should have a maintenance yeah. provision. Yeah. Yeah. We'll just make sure. It can be yeah. funny, but not, not in a good way. Is that, is that it for you, Peg? But even if it's not a funny no. thing, it just looks It looks really low and run down like they didn't care. And we can, yeah. we will look at the maintenance yeah. issue. Yes, you come to you. Patrick, did you have anything else? Then we'll start with Carol, then we'll go Corinna, and then. Okay. For illuminated signs, do we have a restriction on how bright they can be? Is that part of the lighting code or anything? There is, there is something, I thought, because years ago on council, when I was on council, no, it was like people being able to spot flying saucers just about with, with lighting. Yep. So it was a, um, a light pollution issue. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's the direction I'm going. I've read it somewhere. That in the land use code, in the zoning code, 
for site lighting, absolutely we regulate that mm -hmm. where so where it can't really go off premise. Mm -hmm. We do not have a brightness requirement for illumination of signs themselves. And what I'd like to suggest is I'm very familiar with that. Lots of cities across the country have what we call dark sky ordinances, which are designed to address these very types of things, illumination, and making sure that things are not overly lit. That is on our list <laughs> of things for us to look at. Where I would rather not do, I'd rather recommend to you not to do it in here, but let us address the dark sky issue comprehensively so we have something that's connected again. Same same question. Um, where my, my concern, though, is more about a blinding light that go, ends up going into traffic um, because of a bright white light Absolutely. On, on a sign. And, and what I, uh, would happen if you were to look at a, uh, a dark sky ordinance in a number of cities? Would they require the lights to be shielded. The lights have to shine down. They can't shine out on the traffic. Okay. And they require uh, that uh, there is illumination requirements, and there are those types of things. Uh, I think in, you can do that and still maintain the type of lighting that people want in the neighborhoods from a safety and security standpoint. We can address that, that's but that's what I'd recommend that we address it. And then for one, one more thing, and I'll be done with my questions. Um, for the, um, the we, we have an instance where the... Um, the, the sign is inside a building. I sent you a picture yes. of that. Uh, but it's really clear that it's a sign, even though it is enclosed. Um, are, are we able to address that for that or for future um, tricks like that? Right. Well, I think right, <coughs> right now we uh, address signs as uh, a visually communicative image Based on public display and visible from the exterior of any portion of the public right of way or place. So the fact is, if it's visible uh, and it's inside, we, we will look at that. And uh, let us look at that a bit because the difficulty is we have a First Amendment issue that we have to balance, which is we don't want to be getting involved in things looking inside that are communicating First Amendment speech. But on the other hand, uh, I'll take a a well-known business that doesn't have this kind of sign. And we use the uh, Apple store. If the Apple has the word Apple hanging down inside the store, but you can see it all the way through the glass and it's all lit, you can see it all the way out to Santa Fe, it may be inside the store, but it's a sign. <laughs> the one I'm talking about, I, I believe, can be seen from, well, it certainly can be very well seen from the outside. I don't think it can be seen from the inside at all, even though it actually is inside the enclosure. So like, a, couple back of, of a, a couple examples of that. So as part of a business, we, we limit, I assume we limit the number of square feet of signage you can have on a building, right? Yes. So yes. we've always would calculate that sign in a window as part of that square footage. I don't know if our code is space <laughs> And that's what Unless it was set back a certain distance, I think Parker it had to be back a certain number of inches and from the window. From the outside, I think it was counted as part of your signage that's allowed on the front end of that business. So you're going to look in. We will, yep. yeah. We, we will will definitely look in. Steve, Steve will Council, we've reached our time limit almost. Do you want to add 10 minutes to this? Because I know there's other questions. So we'll add, add 10 minutes. Is that go? Mine are going to be quick. We can exhaust the five, I think. Five? Okay, we'll Council's go five more us a good job. Uh, if you can make it quick, because I think Kyle, you had to. Just go quick and I'll. Just the. Further, uh, the um, realtor signs, that would also apply to garage sale signs and things like that, so it really encompasses everything. And then um, the, the flags, the, the whole discussion that we had on flags, I, I, I want to caution us, and I think it goes for the flags, it might even speak to signs inside the, the store <laughs> itself, the balance of over-regulating. <coughs> And then our ability to actually, ability and cost to then monitor and maintain and, you know, what's, what's the right balance. The balance. Yep. Um, so I think let's just make sure we're, we're looking at the subject and say, what are we trying to address as opposed to trying to overregulate that? Um, and then not something to answer, but maybe something to think about. And Steve, we touched on this a little bit. So when you talk about 
the limitations of um, you need 42 inches for ADA and there's trees and there's fire hydrants and downtown we have the signs that the city has put up. So those also serve as a way to promote a business. If a business, there are likely some businesses that may want to put a sandwich board out, but now the city sign is taken away from that space and they are not allowed to. So I don't know how we address that. Or, but. Well, that would be, I think, something that we would ha have to make a decision as a city whether uh, we feel that sign needs to stay there, whether we feel it needs to move. Uh, it's kind of like we'll put up a roadway sign that may well affect somebody's ADA account, uh, ability to have a sign. If we feel honestly that as a matter of traffic control it has to be there, we're not going to move it. But I, on the wayfaring signs, that's a little bit different. And I think what we would expect would be that we'd sit down with the property owner and see if we could find an accommodation. Now, maybe the way, we can the way some find signs. Do we have regulations on who can advertise in those things? And uh, yes. We do. We actually have a little bit of a provision in the code that talks about that uh, they are permitted for uh, public and quasi-public buildings, parks, cultural historic definitions, public interest, city entries and neighborhood entries, um, locations and destinations that the city finds it would be a public benefit. But, uh, you don't have to read to me. I'm just saying we do have something. <laughs> yes. 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 That's basically what it is. Yeah. And we look at those it's things. managed through economic yeah. development. So if someone's so interested. We, we do have some guidelines. Do you have anything else? All right. Three quick things. Historical signs. Say, I don't know, I can't think of an example, but say there's a historical sign that there's some significance to the community that does not meet these uh, regulations. Is there some way that there, we could, there would be a variant say, yes, we find this business that's been around for 150 years or whatever. In terms of a non-conforming sign, there are ways, if this is adopted, we will actually have provisions in the code that are workable to evade non-conforming signs. Okay, perfect. Second, commercial, it said, uh, commercial mascots and rotating signs yes. are not allowed. So no Ronald McDonald uh, by the uh, drive-thru? I mean, or the that, cow from... Or the cow from Chick-fil-A, so that, I mean, we're... Okay. So we're saying that's not allowed? I that's what that's, it's already not allowed in the current code. Yeah. The Statue of Liberty tax time at the corner of... That's You're not, that's not... What about the tractor for State Farm? Yeah, right. I mean, on the little board. What? The tractor. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, What's that's, the difference between a commercial mascot and a logo? Because everything, I mean, that's that's getting a less. That, that, that's temporary, just like a flag. A commercial a mascot, as I define that code, it's a person or animal costume yeah. dec that's decorated to function as a commercial advertising device, and or a robotic device that's designed to function as an advertising device. So. And, so that, I mean, that's what I was thinking, Robin, you know, they used to have a drive through and you know, there's a kid, Ronald McDonald stand there, so we can't have the Ronald McDonald or... Uh, uh, either a mechanical Ronald McDonald? Well, I've seen a lot, of, to replace the people that are waving the signs, they put those mechanical things out now. Is that what that's getting at, or... Well, those air blow yes. things, you know. Air you can have a Ronald McDonald as part of the regular sign, you just can't have a robotic one, or you can't have a human one, you can have just a Ronald McDonald. So we can't have a... Somebody dress up as Ronald McDonald and hold a sign out for. Uh, okay. well, those are uh, currently in the code. You that's currently in the code, with the exception of with the public forum areas. We do have to permit sign walkers, and so we have a specific yeah. provision in the code to address sign walkers. As long as they're not dressed as a mascot. As long as <laughs> so what about happens with like if Dinger, one of the sports team mascots, come down and is promoting come see our game this weekend? That's uh, not allowed. And uh, the question there would be whether it falls within the definition of, uh, if you go back to the commercial mascot, the definition talks about uh, advertising uh, commercial speech of them, uh, conveying a commercial message. And I, I mean, message. the other thing, not to get too far off, but let's just say that were to happen, generally that's probably going to be as a special event. A special event. Which is a different right. structure, so they wouldn't necessarily come under regulation here. This would be... I've got my business that is there permanently. Right. I have Ronald McDonald or someone out front. Yeah. I can't do that. As a total commercial mascot spinning my menu sign. What's, my what's the rationale for banning mascots? 
It is in our code today. I think the it's additional signage is just considered more signage <coughs> and on a I think part of it is just, just distraction, just distraction. Keep, right. distraction. And, and waving and distracting and taking your eyes off the road. It's a safety issue. Okay. And then um, what, the last question for the appeals, does it go directly to the Board of Adjustment or go to the Community di uh, Development Director? Well, uh, the way that this would be proposed if this was adopted would be that the Community Development Director is the enforcement arm and what would occur is initially the, um, they would have to appeal to the Community Development Director then they could uh, request a hearing before the city manager or a hearing officer. I would expect it to be a hearing officer uh, on the sign. And then if they did not like the independent hearing officer's decision on the sign, then they would be able to proceed in front of the court under what we call Rule 106. So they would go basically community development director, city manager, independent hearing, or the city manager, and I expect the city manager would just go to an independent hearing officer where we will hire lawyers and independent hearing officer. They'll have a full blown hearing there, and then if they don't like the result, they go right, they can go right to court. So I, I, you know, if there's a sign I have an issue with, I go to Josh and say, appealing this, you're, that you allowed that. And meet with you, have you know, and then I still don't like the outcome. Then we go to we go to a hearing officer, and there's a, and I've done this with hearing officers. It actually works extremely well because what happens is the hearing officer is not an employee of the city, so both sides feel that there's independence. There's a full record from the department that the hearing officer has. They can actually take testimony. It's kind of like a mini trial, uh, and then they actually write a formal opinion that if a court has to review, there's actually a formal opinion that they uh, can work from. It is, I would tell you it's a procedure that I've used in procurement, it's a procedure that I've used in many areas, and it's used by most cities in this state for these types of things, and it works extremely well. I have a couple of questions, and we gotta, then we'll wrap it up here. So on the, the, the mural that was in Inglewood some, about 10 years ago, went to Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court. Yeah. So, uh, uh, we have that involved in our murals? They went all the way to Supreme yeah. Court. Then also, on the medical marijuana, we do limit what can be presented on those signs. I don't know if that's a state law or whatever. Well, and I mean, obviously, uh, there's certain speech that's not protected. For example, uh, obscene speech is defined usually referring to either specified parts of the anatomy or specified sexual conduct. You can't, uh, we can certainly uh, regulate those kinds of things. Obscenity has never been constitutionally protected. Uh, we probably would get a little bit more, uh, in, from a lawyer standpoint, a little bit more dicey would be if somebody did a mule and uh, the mule was join the KKK. That now becomes, because obviously it's going to be highly offensive to a huge number of people. There's also the question of, is that political speech? As objectionable as we may find it, is it political? And I would tell you, those are the things that give lawyers uh, nightmares. Because you have to basically look at both the political speech aspect as well as the uh, sign code aspect. Um, and um, that becomes a, a, a very, very difficult thing. Now, I would tell you the obscenity is easy. Some of the other things are very, very uh, easy to address. The, the stuff that's borderline political versus offensive, what we might call hate speech, gets really, really difficult. It, it might... My last concern is is that enforcement. Sometimes we, we discussed it a little bit, sometimes we enforce this stuff and sometimes we don't. And I'm thinking right now, there's a sign down in Little uh, Main Street where it had been there forever, maybe it's the old Ames Cafe, and I think that sign is still there. Never gets any problem, but there's another company down there that gets, uh, recently, not recently, within the last couple of years at least, but they were getting harassed to pull down an old sign. So, what is our enforcement? What are, how are we going to be consistent on this? Well, why, that's why... And do we have the manpower to enforce this? 
That's why we adapted the yes. other provisions because our current provisions don't. Our current provisions are very difficult. I mean, they they get into all sorts. If you look at the current provisions in the code, and you got sixty seconds. We have uh, things <laughs> such as we're supposed to serve the uh, property owner. We're supposed to serve the owner of the sign. We're supposed to uh, then uh, do it. Uh, we'll cut into the chase right now. Our current code does not allow sandwich board signs downtown, but we put any enforcement on hold pending this coming forward to right. go through right. the update process. I guess when we when this does come to council, I presume it's going to come to council. Right. The uh, let, let's talk about enforcement. How are we going to enforce? I mean, it's great to have stuff in writing. I know we need to have that, but it's 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 not so great if we don't enforce what we say we're going to. Right. Or, the we general, have, uh, or the manpower uh, associated. Generally, with it. exactly. Generally, exactly. how we've been doing code enforcement primarily due to manpower issues, is um, complaint-based. I think there's some structure of warning, first offense, second offense. No, and we have that as well. There's that into it, but we're not generally going out proactively. I think in downtown we've done that differently in the past so that we can contemplate that and bring some ideas forward because maybe there is some hybrid for downtown and the sandwich boards, like, especially if we're trying to keep that ADA clearance, you know what I mean? To have I guess when you, when you present this to us, this have a plan yeah. that is yeah. the, the other piece saying. of this. Is yeah. that, mm -hmm. is there anything else, Council? Cool. Okay. Got it. We'll do. Right. You want to take a five minute or what? Move on. Let's move on. Move on. Okay. Okay, this one we have 45 minutes, but then we will probably run over it as well. It's good to have time frames on it. That's a new free channel looking at. We have it for our regular meetings. Oh, okay. Yep, yep, for, for that. Excellent. Thank you. We pages, so it's only to take us, you know, half the amount. Right, that's the sign stuff, I tell you what, that is just. Obviously, it's not a problem. I told you, it's a messy one. Yeah. All right, cool. So, we're going to move on to our second item, which is going to be on the uh, potentially the code amendments to the plant development overlay and the same presenters. Yes, so switching topics, you guys. So, um, plan development overlay is our topic now. Um, and I'm sorry I did not introduce Carol Cohn earlier. I invited her to come specifically um, to help us through that because we see a lot of current planning and um, re requests for use of this section of our land use code. So, we do want to bring this forward to you to, in the spirit of trying to continue to make changes to make a workable code and clean things up and make it usable and clear for everyone. So um, the topic tonight, um, just quickly to go over, um, and then we're going to tag team it, all of us here. Um, we want to remove the option of land development overlay oh, wait, um, from residential districts, um, remove the option to um, get a reduction in parking through PDO, um, remove the density increase option from PDO intent statement and clarify densities and floor area ratios in the PDO. Move those into the respective um, individual zone districts. Um, other clarifications, we want to modify allowances for PDOs in the zone districts of CA and T, um, and then some other additional um, clarifications to that. So, Generally, though, let's back up one. If, if you get, step, before you get too step. far into this, yes. if you will, Stephen, yeah. I know you were going to do some yep. definitions. Yep. 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 So, sorry, I missed. Can you slow down just a little bit? Can <laughs> 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 Jerry say hurry up? Can you say slow down? <laughs> <laughs> it's just, just, a, a, just a picture of our zoning map. Map. This map. This one's our PDO. Yeah. So, so we'll get to that. So we'll get to that. So first, to your point, we would like to explain to you what is an overlay and what is this. Exactly. Um, so in land use, overlays are basically relative, excuse me, regulatory tools to help guide development for that area of the city, um, or in this case, it's a voluntary um, overlay. The intent of Littleton's PDO chapter and process is to provide flexibility and encourage a higher level of design that would be typically required through the, the adherence to the minimum development standards in the underlying zone district. Which so one supersedes? Underlying zone district is your zoning. You could apply to put a PDO overlay, that's why it's called an overlay basically on top of it, that gives specific performance standards or development standards for that property. But the zoning is the is your base starting point. And through PDO in Littleton, 
you can apply to change some of those performance standards from the underlying zoning district through that PDO process. With the so, idea being that you would get a higher quality of development. Right. That was the result. thinking yes. behind it. The theory of the PDO. But for, yeah. but for example, let's just use an example. What that means is, let's just say I'm building something downtown and I decide, you know what, through the PDO, the, the height requirement in CA, <coughs> I'm, it's difficult for me to meet that because I want to bring in this really cool quality architecture and design feature. Um, so I might look at the PDO to say, hey, you know what, I can seek uh, increase in my height for this property and this project if I provide this level of design with the building through the PDO process. So there's a few things that you can look to change through the through PDO in your underlying development requirements. But typically the overlay district is like you have your basic stuff, your rules of engagement, but these are some extra things you put on, extra rules and requirements. We call it an overlay district. Right. right. We don't call it an overlay district. Right. So but that's we don't, typically we don't, we don't have, have it that way. Right. At right. the so moment in little. We were trying to explain what how other jurisdictions uh -huh. use it. So. so other jurisdictions, like in Arapahoe County, they have one that um, was an intergovernmental agreement between the um, city of Centennial and unincorporated Arapahoe County. And they put extra requirements on these areas that were in possible annexation area that Centennial could come in and annex. So they said, okay, well, there's some extra things you have to do because we might want it later. Right. So this is a uh, example is like the downtown. And the question for the attorney, and how is this working? <laughs> now, I mean, so as Carol said, that's how an overlay should work. Should work. Should should work. Yes. Right. That's, that's how it should work. Because the planning commission deals with these things all the time. Uh, that's not how it works here. But that's not how that's it works. Not how it Under the existing up. code, it kind of works the opposite. You could use the plan development overlay to uh, up your density, not lower your density, not give the city more. You could use it as a way to... Uh, avoid meeting certain requirements. That is totally opposite. <coughs> I'll have to be honest, I've again looked at many a zoning code in my career. I have never seen a zoning code that works like this. And just why me, we're bringing some of this forward you, for you tonight, yeah. because we have some concern that we would like to be addressed through these amendments to ensure we don't. You know what I mean? Can change the character in certain parts of the city as well as we don't allow an increase in density. I'd like radio. to make a statement. Um, when there is an overuse of, a, of PDOs, lot by lot by lot, lot is an indication that something's not working well in our zoning or, or otherwise. Yes. So it's it's, it's manifested itself as an alternative to what's there, so we really should be looking. We, I'm glad we're looking at this because that's not how it should be used, and it forces us to look at um, is our zoning meeting the needs of our community. Well, so, honestly, that is why you're seeing this. I mean, uh, as we said before, we have about a 30 car train of different things we are proposing to come to you in land use. So you may say, why is this car number four? Well, the reason is, uh, as Councilmember Allard just said, we've seen now people using the PDO in this way to essentially avoid uh, basically what we'd call property development requirements. And it, that made this rise up to the top because we need to address this. this. They were using it like a variance, but without having to prove a hardship. And so it would all, or a rezoning or to increase your density. But it didn't go to council, so it just stopped at planning commission. So it, it's not that so it was like being misused yeah. in some yeah. ways. Does that explain back to your question, Jerry? Does yeah, that I, help? I wanted okay. to explain for a um, So with that, as Carol and I and Steve prepared this, we then realized we needed more how to explain this to you guys. So we do have quite a few visuals to help. Um, and with that, we'll launch into <coughs> this is for residential and commercial? Right now, now okay. PDO is allowed anywhere in the city. And there isn't a size limit of where it can be used on a quarter acre lot or a 20-acre parcel. But yeah. we do have a size limitation in a rezoning, and it's limited to 180,000 square feet, which is why we've seen this coming more and more. 180,000 square foot lot is a little over four acres. It's pretty big, so find four acres in the city that can be redeveloped. So people have been using this 
to them looking towards to look, this, yeah. yeah, to see if they can to use this because they can't rezone. Right. Because right. of that, and it's somewhat of a loophole when it's not right. Safe. And if you and if you consider the 180,000 square feet, it made sense when the code was written because we had lots of land, and so it was okay. Let's rezone this. We're we're annexing. We're moving through life in Littleton, growing right. bigger. In the 70s. Right? In the 70s, in the 70s, right? But now 180,000 square feet is just huge for what we have. So for some background, here is the zoning map showing you where we actually have approved PDOs throughout the city. And you'll notice each of them still has their underlying zone district and just has a PDO in addition to that. So. And you can see a concentration in downtown in the football area. There's a lot of them, but they're tiny lots, but there's a concentration there. What is the, I'm sorry if you, yeah. what is the one kind of right in the middle? Looks like a little building, the yellow one. What is that? That's oh, that's an R three or an R two PDO. Yes. Yep. Not exactly We're sure. Not I think that's an apartment uh, no, there's some complex. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a a top of my house. Thumber yeah. Seminary, maybe. That's Kaylee. Thumber Seminary. No, no, no. She's, he's talking about a small little one. Oh. Dead center. They were the rectangle, the, the yellow thing in the middle. The dark one. Yeah. A little chimney on it. For the orange. Yeah, a little yeah. chimney, a little. Yeah. Top. Yes. Yeah. A hat or something on it. Not exactly sure, but yeah. generally. So you can see where we have them. Um, so then just jumping now into the code provisions itself, in preparing this, we realized that we also needed to clean up the intent statement, um, and that hadn't been um, proposed strikeouts in your packet. Um, so we do want to cl further clarify what this is. So really it's about um, flexible site design, um, <coughs> Is possible um, through this process, but there's no ability to change um, density density through this at all because that would be considered a reason. All that's left is that first half of that sentence. That's there. currently in the code right now, and we're proposing that we strike that out because, as you can see, it's being used to transfer density, right. Right. increase density, and that's again getting away from what really a PDO is supposed, uh, an overlay district is supposed to be. Right. So just what we're maybe that, that first right. line. That, yeah. Perfect. Because yeah. it's yeah. still in this. Yep. yep. And, and also on the second one on applicability. Same so you'll see that when it comes back. Um, so then the other piece in the PDO chapter, in this chapter 9, we do have um, some content changes that we would like to do. And the first one is right now, right now through a PDO process, you can seek a reduction in your parking requirements. Um, interestingly, you cannot, if you're doing a rezone or into a plan development, you actually cannot um, get a reduction in parking through the PDO. Aside from the des des excuse me, historic designation, the historic downtown, um, the only way you can get a reduction in parking is through the PDO. So that really doesn't, number one, make sense when you can't do it through a plan development. Um, and it really doesn't make sense given um, where Littleton is today and the issues that we have around parking. It really is important that projects do Park, um, you know the the whatever their use is that they're proposing. So and the point that you made earlier, Carol, was if you need some of these variances, you can you you, you would have to show hardship mm -hmm. as opposed to saying I'll right. give you a prettier yes. building. Right. If you have, if you were seeking a, um, a variance through one of the under one of the underlying zone districts, you'd have one of the things is what's the hardship? Was it self-imposed? You don't have to do that through the PDO. You just go through the process. And also, if you can't do it in a PD, which is a much higher level of scrutiny, if you can't change your parking, why would you be allowed to do it in a PDO? We didn't understand that, so we'd like to be re uh, proposing removing that. Yep. Um, also, with this, the other piece we would like to do, um, and again, just to restate the point, is we do not want, through a PDO process, anyone to have the ability to get an increase or transfer of density. Again, that should be through a PD, a PD amendment or a PD um, process, plan development process. Um, it's really, at the end of the day, the decision maker should be looking at that type of a request is the city council. And as you guys know, the PDO goes only to the planning commission. That is right there. Um, other clarifications. Um, 
we, we wanted to further strengthen in the PDO chapter about that um, they have to be compatible with adopted design standards and guidelines that are applicable. Um, and then if it's within, the, if the property is within the historic district, then um, the review of the architecture will be referred to the Historic Preservation Board. Um, and then the last one. So it says coordinate with. Is it chit-chat, or is there no, some... No, it means that they go to the it's a, use of words. It's 10-9-8-A. Um, like, well, I'm sorry, 10 it's nine in a PDO chapter right now. We're just yeah. wanting to clarify uh -huh. that when a PDO comes in on a property that's in the historic district, that we refer that application to the Historic Preservation Board through a COA process for them to look at the design being Right now it says de defer the review of the proposal. So we're saying that it, we're proposing that it refers it to HPB for review. So we should have said refer instead of coordinate on this slide. Yeah. So, but the, the packet has referred to HPB okay. for, yeah. Okay. And that, yeah. I think, the certificate of historic appropriateness. So. Yes. Not just chit chat. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Um, the other, let's see, before we get into this slide, the other big thing is we do want to not allow an option for um, people to bring in a PDO application in a residential zone district. One of the things that we've been really scrutinizing and looking at lately is um, how do we make sure that our residential areas stay within the character that they most of them are built out and really within that structure. How do we preserve that? We realize that PDO, not that it's been used very often, but it is an opportunity for some an application to come in that could be quite different than what is allowed in that residential zone district. So it seems appropriate to not allow PDO in any residential zone districts. So it's coming just totally out. Well, that's, that's the, oh, the residential the, for, for residential. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also in the CA zone district as well. well. Yeah, we'll get to yeah. that. Um, so this slide here is showing you that currently in this chapter nine, there's a list of both the maximum densities and floor area ratios for our individual zone districts. When we realized we wanted to clean that up and take that out and actually put it into the res to the zone districts themselves, um, we realize that a lot of the zone districts don't actually have maximum densities or maximum floor area. Now some do, but not all. So we want to next go through and show you by taking these out of the PDO and actually putting them into the zone district what that looks like, just so that people can be clear where the maximums are. Because right now, we generally refer people what their maximum density, we use the reference in this PDO section. I'm getting confused in the mm -hmm. language when I read it. Right, so we're gonna walk you through each one of those maps that we have. We're gonna take you to each one of the zone districts in the city and then show you the changes and walk you through. I know it's it's cumbersome and lengthy, but I think you need to get through it and see what the changes are. You're gonna do that right now? We're gonna do it real quick, quick though. We're good. good. So, so you're striking here and adding. Adding so that we don't Under each have, district. Each yes. have a slippage in between. Mm -hmm. yep. yes. Consistency. Yep. So it's it's all this no, it all language. Gets, it all gets yep. done at the same time. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. Is there a way to make so the commercial estate is just being moved, right? So the this slide here, we're taking out all, so this shows you both the densities and the floor area. Right. We're taking all of this out and putting them into the respective zone right. districts. What we're saying is if you a PDO in a commercial district, you can still apply to use the PDO. We just don't want you to have the PDO opportunity in residence. Right. What I was just thinking is, is there a way to make that into a table as an appendix at the end? Just we'll, we'll walk you through it. It's sure. not, yeah. not going to be in this we'll format move. anymore. It's moving yeah. to the zone we'll district. Yeah. So we'll show you. And have an appendix. To okay. The and we'll get yeah. a table. I'll work on that for next. Yep. Okay. 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 Show that yes, we tried. We've been struggling. Anyway, so we're going to take it from the top. A one, A one. Just to starting show you, with A. Here's all the A one property we have in the city. Just there's 898 that. acres of A one in the city, mostly South Platte Park uh, and the reservoir. So the cool. reservoir. Yep, yep. Um, currently, it does not have the maximum density, so we're taking the maximum density listed 
from the PDO for A1 and putting this into the A1 district, one dwelling unit per 10 acres. That's the change proposed there. Um, the, so this is just to show you. The other thing we want to clean up is the lot size um, and, and making sure that these are minimum. So it's just trying to make this a little cleaner and consistent. You'll see we're trying to use the same verbiage on lot sizes and minimums in all of the zone districts. And how they were getting there to that 43,560 is an acre, 43,560. And so you would see that that's now the minimum lot air size, and this is consistent through all of them. How they got to density was through the minimum lot size. And that's not how you do density. You say X number of dwelling units per acre. You don't say one dwelling unit per 10 acres. So we're making it consistent with the industry throughout. So you're striking out at front setback here. So the minimum lot width can be measured in the front, in the middle, or in the back. So potentially if you have like a triangle lot, you can have 300 width in the back, but in the front it's 20. So minimum lot feet. width is, is measured at the front, at the, at the front the lot line. The front, and so what the people were doing is if you had a 50 foot setback, they would have a skinny See, lot and it would get really fat. Uh -huh. So this keeps that from happening. So you don't have skinny tiny lots and then a big bulb out. But you're, you're crossing out the front. Right. So well, it's just standard practice uh -huh. in planning world that right. lot width is measured at the front. Front lot line, yep. Yeah. Versus the setback, which could be 10 feet, 20 feet back, yeah. however. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm trying to follow the agricultural. If something's agricultural, how does it wind up having so many um, dwelling units? One per 10 acres? Not many. One per 10, 10 acres. Not many. One dwelling unit per 10 acres. So you can't, you have one house on 10 acres. On 10 acres. Oh, yeah, but 0 0.10 per acre. That's the, this, same thing. It's the same thing. I understand the math. Right. I'm not understanding if it's agricultural, how it winds up having more units. I mean, having more than one unit. Almost. So dwelling units. So I you suppose could have, if they yeah. have 20 acres, or excuse me, Right, then maybe you have two homes on it. Mm -hmm. You can to have manage the yeah. farm or whatever. A workman, like if it's true right. agriculture, we don't really have it in the city. I mean, like in right. the counties, they have a lot of it. So you'd get a farmhand person, um, house um, workers. You could have agricultural worker housing and stuff. That's why you can have multiple. You can have up to two structures on um, residential lots. So really. if we don't really have that, why do we have something that looks like we have that? Well, what we're trying to do is make the PDO section workable. We're not trying to change all of the zoning districts per se. I think that's a very valid point. When we get to that larger conversation about all the zone districts we have in the city, do we need to change them or do we need them all? Right now, all we're wanting to do is take that density out of the PDO and put it appropriately within each okay. of the zone districts and that it's referencing. And we know this more clearly. Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. people don't know where to look. Yeah. What she's really saying is, when, yes, we know that we have things in our zoning districts. That's, again, part of this whole vision, the comp plan, the code. As we work through that, there's no question we will come back to zoning districts and then we would move our zoning districts so that they fit into what the council has essentially established as the vision and the comp plan. But to do that right now, we're missing it. But we also know that we have pieces in our zoning code that are problems and they can't wait. So what you're seeing right now is where we find problems that can't wait. We're coming to you and saying, and this is a classic one of something that can't wait that we need to address now because it's a problem. So you'll see this consistently how we're doing on one all. So then moving along, RS is a teeny little green dot in the middle, four parcels, so 10 acres, and then a yeah, couple other ones, yeah. Couple of us. So then this one also did not have maximum density, so we're moving it from the PDO section now into the RS zone district itself, one dwelling unit per five acres. Um, and then that's what, this is showing you the actual strike out language. From your packet. From your packet. Yeah, yeah from your packet. Yeah. yeah. So we're telling you what we did and showing you where it is in the packet on every single one of these. Yep. Yeah. So that's that. Um, RL, 82 parcels, 156 acres. You can sort of see where that is. Um, again, also did not have maximum density in the zone district, so we're moving that from the 
PDO section into this one dwelling unit per two acres. Here it is, the strikeout. And then with the 0.5 per acre for the normal way you do yep. densities. So we're moving that. Um, RE, again, here's the number of parcels and acres in that zone district today. Um, again, similarly. Um, um, so this one has a couple more clarifications, I guess. Um, but again, the same concept, bringing density that was listed in the PDO section for this zone district and putting it actually in the district um, where it should be and further clarifying that. Um, R1. We have a lot of R1 compared to... RS. The others were yep, getting, yep. getting bigger. Yep. Um, same thing. Didn't have max. Doesn't have maximum density. We're moving it um, and clarifying what that means and putting it into the zone district language itself. Also with that two dwelling units per acre. Yep. R two. Here's the parcels and acreage. Got a lot of that. Again, taking that um, density from PDO, putting it into the R two zone district. Um, 4.8 dwelling units per acre. There it shows it to you. R2, R3. Same thing. I mean, yeah. so, so moving the, the density into the zone district itself. And when we say it didn't have a maximum density, it was getting there through lot area, so that's how it was getting there, so we're making sure it's clear that it's maximum density. Show it. R3X. Our one little spot of R3X. R3X. Yep. 12.3 acres. Teeny tiny little bit. That's bigger than a couple of the others. Yep. Um, again, same same thing. Further clarifying 13.4 dwelling units per acre is what is the maximum for that. There it is in the strike out. R4. Um, same, and moving that 13.4 dwelling units an acre, putting that into the zone district itself. Which just so happens to be the same density as R3X, so I don't know why we have R3X and R4, but, but is we Is there do. a difference but between the definition of R3X and R4? What, yes. the, what was the difference in definition? It's that there's the appearance of single family. Mm -hmm. Transition from single family to multifamily is what it says in R3X, and then R4 is medium density development. Oh, well, that's it's to more intense development. Yeah. Similar, so, again, to Peggy's point, we definitely have future conversations coming as we get into the so each you might zone see district. this one coming so, back. <laughs> anyway, yeah. It's like a preview of what's yeah. to come. So, R5. R5 has a little bit more in it than um, the other ones. As far as changes, changes. right? Mm -hmm. um, but again, the same concept of the density, putting that into the zone district itself. Um, so you'll see that here. Um, and and yes. Um, the other thing that we were looking at in this one for R5 was, specifically. Was considering um, in, in the packet you saw in your T zone district, there's the ability, we, we proposed removing the ability to increase the height if you increase the setback in the transition zone district. And since um, we, for consistency throughout the code, if you can't do it through, you know, what's the mechanism to allow it? Like if your maximum height's 30 feet, but I want to move it back another foot from my setback, how, you know, then you could go up, let's say we move it 10 feet back, and then you're just going up 10 feet taller, and the impact could be much greater. So to make consistent throughout the other zone districts we proposed, Possibly, it's not in your packet, but we're presenting it tonight as an option for the council to consider removing that ability to increase the height if you increase the setback. In R5. In R5. Specifically, mm -hmm. right now it's allowed in R5. Is it allowed in any other? CA, we've proposed, uh, that's C also in CAT C -A -T and R5. R5 allow an increase in height or an increase in setback. Mm -hmm. And you're proposing to remove that for all three of those? Yeah. And if you like the concept, we're not asking you one way or the other. We'll bring back, <coughs> we'll study that further and look at what that implicates. This is really just a start to get things cleaned up. Yes. Yep. 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 So, so it's had some consistency, and then that was the proposal, taking it out, you know, yep. adding that that was the height that was used in T where we took it out of, proposed taking it out of T. So we're just saying the maximum building height in R5 is 30 feet. Um, then in T, and then again, that's 
46 acres. Those mm -hmm. are all That's zone T. Some question on the, on the height. Yeah. That's, um, that's the peak of the roof. Of the, <laughs> of the roof of the dirt. Mm -hmm. That's <coughs> since my house. Sorry, it's hard to see the tension. Is that typical two story houses? <laughs> So 30 feet. 30 feet. <laughs> so typically it's 12 to 15 feet for a story. So if you figure two stories would be 30 feet. Um, three stories is 45 feet in general. Not attics. Well, it would all be inside of the pit pitched roof. So you don't count the inside. We, planning doesn't worry about what's going on, on the inside. We worry about what the outside looks like. Yeah, so if you have the I'm, appearance. But I'm just saying in, in practice. So you may have a two story house that also has. Um, some attic, so that would be to the top of the roof that would be encompassed in there. So it's from the dirt to the top of the roof. Okay. And then T, again, removing that doesn't have a maximum density or F floor area ratio. Um, so we have, we're moving the units from the PDO to the T zone district, as well as the floor area ratio was not included in the T zone district. I have another question. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. So we have a uh, we have a diagram. Um, it's out on the website, and so you would take. So you're allowed to have the walkout condition. You can take an average. So of the, we, of the, of the, all of four sides. sides. So you'd find a datum point. It's we've we've had to explain this a lot to people. But you take a datum point if you have more than a ten foot grade difference. So you've got one side of your house, one side of your house. If it's more than ten foot grade difference you can go up 10 feet to start your new zero, and then you go up to the top of the roof, and that's for your one side. Then you do the same for the other sides, and then you can take an average of that to get your building height. And that's been in the building code for the, and the definitions and the zoning code. Maybe I'm going to Yep. years ago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's a big deal in that one, yeah. Um, so moving those, um, the one thing that we are recommending here is, is this it? Is it on the No, it's the end. Okay. Yeah. That was the old. Got it. Okay. So that's basically that one. Oh my gosh. Here I know, it got really tiny, but I wanted to capture both pieces. Yeah. Again, just to share with you, we're moving the information to the zone district, getting rid of that um, additional increase in height with a step back piece, um, and to clean it up. CA, here's your number of acres. Um, again, putting that density from PDO into the CA district, and um, the floor area ratio as well. So, um, this one is interesting. We have two densities. Is that what you're going to get to? Yeah, this one I wanted to read yeah. for a second. This yeah. one's a little difficult with the, um, and it's also similar to R5. If you look at R5 in your packet, they have um, different densities for townhouses, and there's no zero lot line condition, that, and we've proposed that, so we, maybe we should go back to R5. We didn't have a slide on that. No, it's okay. So if we go back to your R5 in your packet, it's right before the CA stuff, you'll see, um, you have your um, townhome conditions. What page, sorry? Um, shoot, I didn't know. You in Granicus or in you in the... Granicus. So it's right before CA, um, the townhome. I'm at 52, but I'm using the one that Colleen sent and had the agenda. Yeah. I've got to work on that. The one on page numbers. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. We should have done the numbering too, but we have study session, so page but study sessions. So um, and we we're trying to get direction from you. So the um, building setback from the internal lot line. So right now in R5, you have um, large setbacks. There's five feet and ten feet. But if you actually have a townhouse which has individual lots, which would because you can own the yard, not just a condominium where you own the airspace. There was no zero lot line condition. So you didn't have, so you could never have a townhouse. So they could never touch each other because there was no setbacks to allow it. So people were using the PDOs to get through that, you know, get get that condition because there's a provision to have the townhouses with the smaller lots of 2,500 square feet, but you could never get there. 
So it was another one of those things didn't talk to each other, so we're trying to fix that and add that zero lot line condition. Which would therefore allow townhouses on an R5. Mm -hmm. Which and if they were already allowed, it's just you could never really make it work without going through the PDO process. And so this would allow for the ownership of the land, not just the airspace. So what was happening with the townhouses that were out, townhouses in quotes, out there, is that they were really condominiums. They were never really owning. So if you bought one of those, like the eight units over off of Sycamore, you would only be buying the airspace. You'd never buy the ground, the dirt. It's so you would have to own everything. And we'd have to be a different organizational <coughs> setup mm -hmm. under a condo versus a townhouse. Right. And so now by clarifying this in R5, you could, you could do truly a townhouse development. Which would bring another product. A condo. Mm -hmm. it wouldn't, and it wouldn't have, because we're taking it, the only way you can do it right now, to Carol's point, is through the PDO process, right. technically. Mm -hmm. So by taking PDO and not allowing it in residential, we want to make this change so that we can still bring forward mm -hmm. projects mm -hmm. if the town right. is that R5 so district. But it gives you some other housing options instead so of just condominiums. Right. You can then buy the property, too. Like right. That makes sense. Yeah. Or in type of property. Mm -hmm. And then the CA got to that um, with a minimum, so the density in CA was 43.7 <coughs> dwelling units per acre, but through the um, PDO, or so it was 75, I'm sorry, 75 dwelling units per acre, but through the PDO you could increase it to 100 dwelling units per acre in the CA, so we're talking the downtown area, you could increase it to 100 dwelling units per acre through a PDO. So um, we are recommending to delete that 100 units per acre just in infinity um, and keeping with the 75 the underlying yeah. zoning density. Yeah. But yeah. further clarifying that because again you have to right now figure out density through that um, the on our area. area. Okay, so a single family detached residential unit. Per, so if you want one house, you have to have a minimum lot size of 5,500 square feet. And that's what's currently in there right now, and the 575 is currently in there too. And if it's a multi multi-family residential, it's 575 square feet. Right, which Correct. is where you get to that 75 dwelling units per acre. The 575 divided you do by the math. Yeah, if you do the math, 43,560 divided by 575 gets you the math of 75 dwelling units per acre. But for some reason, it was in the PDO section that you could go up to 100. So we're eliminating that, but you are correct. In the CA district right now, it has two different densities for two different um, residential properties. So townhouses would fall under multifamily? Mm -hmm. yes. Anything more than one is multifamily two according to our definition. Two or more. That's not a structure. Right. So we have about 10 minutes, so we, we're going to start asking questions now. So we're, we're almost done. We're almost Promise. Done. Sorry. I'm sorry to go back to this one because this is one that I tripped up. I'm sorry, Jerry. The we are almost done, Jerry. So brownstones that are attached, uh -huh. they're not defined as townhouses, correct? Would they have a party wall? You can do them both ways. So would a, would a brown, brownstones be allowed here? No, yes, because it it's would, a single. No, yes. it would be. It would be allowed, and you would have to make sure multi that. Multi-family residential. Mm -hmm, multi-family. 75 dwelling units per acre. So we're, I'm, I'm looking at that 575 square feet. That's ground. Yeah, it's in our code today. Minimum. That's in the code right now. That's why the nice thing is Tiny house. converted to units per acre. Yeah, so that you can really see, because you look at that and you go 575 square feet, what does that mean? But if right. you see 75.75 dwelling units per acre, you go, wow, that is pretty dense. This you know? thing is yeah. pretty small. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. I mean, my house is 1,000 square feet. So that's, that's hardly... Well, this is the lot area. area. So you would need this much lot area for a unit. So it's really getting the density of the back right. way. It's not really your house can be this... It's not the size right. of the structure. This is that you need this much land. So if you want to do one unit, you have to have at least 575 square feet of land. If you want to do but 10 units, you have to have 5,750 square feet. Yes. If so that's how, how much you need to do that, aren't you going to wind up with something that size? Yeah. No, you just have a three-story... Just stack them. Stack them, yeah. 
staff. You have to meet all the other requirements, but in theory. Yeah, per floor. Stack the units on top of each other. Right. Potentially. Yeah, but still a unit. So you'd have three units, or are you talking about a three-story three three story house? It depends on what the... Yeah. It could be a three-story unit, like those oh. tall, skinny houses. Okay, trying to get it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And okay. that's what's currently okay. in the code, but it's trying to Thank you. clarify it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Is that good? Yes, on that one? Yeah. Okay. Again, this is just showing you the strikeout whole piece. Um, again, going through that. Um, so, similarly to what we just talked about, the R5 and the T, um, considering, consider the increase in height and some of the other right, stuff. Right, to remove that portion where you did it set back every 10 feet. Front, right, the yeah, 10 feet, you get another 10 feet in height. So yes. this is the one from T, which yeah. has 30 feet. But if the minimum height in CA is 40 feet, and then they set it back another 10 feet, they could go up to 50 feet. Well, that really can change the character. If you have and now a 50-foot tall really structure. logical today because of the lot size. Which maybe it made sense in the 70s, but based on how small mm -hmm. things are now, mm -hmm. it's just not functional. So mm -hmm. propose taking that out. Um, and then Sorry, quickly the through the system. rest of these, these should be pretty things. quick. This is VP, um, and again, just putting that floor area ratio component into the zone district and taking it out of the PDO section and cleaning up the, the verbiage about um, minimum lot size. Just so you find stuff that looks the same yeah. in every zone Everyone. district. B1, here's the number of B1 parcels we have. Again, same thing. Um, this one, I don't, actually, we didn't need to change anything. The floor area ratio was also in this existing um, zone district. But this one was more so. just the verbiage of making it consistent from yep. one minimum, maximum, all that. Mm -hmm. B2, 232 acres. Um, and this one did also have a, a maximum floor area ratio, but just trying to clean it up to make it consistent. Um, B3, 100 acres. Um, this one also had the same, mm -hmm. so that's great. Um, IP, 42 acres. This one did not. Did not have the floor area ratio, so again, just moving that into the IP district. So it was completely silent. The only place it could be found was in the PDO section. Makes sense. I won. Um, you guys have fun doing this. I know, sure. I know you did. <laughs> I kind of liked it. I know. I, know. I, saw, I, saw I love it. Stuff. I think it's great. <laughs> I think it's fantastic. Because we were trying to figure out how to explain it in a simple way. Job. I don't know if this is simple or not. I know it's like, like overkill, oh. but I mean, I want you to see exactly what would change so you don't see that you think that right. we're doing anything that we're not right. yeah. telling you about. Yep. So this one, again, the I1, that actually did have the floor area ratio in there. I2, did not, believe it or not. did not. So moving it. Is that real grand? Is that where that is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, mostly. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And um, the Arapahoe County building is actually I2 PDO. It has an I PDO over the I2. So that was on the other one, but that's a hole in the middle. Moving right. that floor area ratio into the language itself, mm -hmm. this district. Um, We're there. So that was it. Quickly, next steps. Um, study session with Planning Commission, if you guys want to move forward. And then we'll do community outreach um, and then bring it back around for adoption in May. Go to planning commission and city council. Oh, thank nope. you. Um, there, uh, so R3X and R4, I think I heard you say they're very similar. Mm -hmm. So I guess I would just ask a question. I know we're trying not to change things, but if these are more or less the same and we're cleaning up, maybe we combine those and call them one. Mm -hmm. So just something that I'd ask you to take a look at. And then, um, mm -hmm. I would like to see a, a little bit more understanding and justification around R5, C, A, and T on this change of if you push it back, it. And okay. does yep. it really make sense for all of them? Could it maybe still make sense for one of these? I'm, I'm going to just throw it out there. Transitional. Transitional is intended to be, you know, one neighborhood may look different than another, so maybe we do want some very uh, right there. And then... What is the difference, or remind me, you might have said this in the beginning, difference between PDO versus PD? Like, why do we have, because now they're becoming more of a similar process as you're proposing, so is there still a need to have the two different ones? Well, so, so there, no, they're, they're not coming similar. No, so are they are coming to the city council? No. No, no. Okay, sorry. No. So the plan development 
district is basically uh, rezoning and where you're setting performance standards, right? And that goes planning commission and city council. So you can put densities in there and other um, uses, all, you know, setbacks, height, all of that in a PD, and that gets approved by city council. This is still recommend or still saying as an overlay. So the underlying, the zoning piece doesn't change. It's just a layer on top of that to change some of the development and standards. And it'll still stop at the uh, planning commission. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And then, final one. Um, an, an, an example of a PDO as a district, and you gave some examples of other cities, was that, so we once upon a time we had the TIZ, the Transit Impact Zone, was that a yeah. district? Yep, that was, yep. I, so uh -huh. that was when it was actually used properly. Right. Okay, we, think so. yeah, we think neither so. of us were the, here right, at that right. time, but, but when we've seen it on maps, it does appear that that was an over. overlay mm -hmm. district. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. yes. So right. that would have been probably the more traditional way. Right. And for the full use. But that was removed. Right. Yep. And sometimes they're done in downtowns. Like, oh, it's, yes. A good example is like design elements. Sometimes you can have an overlay because in this portion of the city, the overlay requires these standards to be met for purposes of design. Mm -hmm. Right? That's that another might be common way to... The, the design, design, downtown design guidelines. Mm -hmm. That yep. one, we could consider that. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that's what really a real overlay would look like is you, it doesn't change the underlying zoning. It sort of graphs on top of it these very specialized standards to reflect the character and nature of an area. Can, can we look at the terminology rather than because that plan development and plan development overlay sound very similar. Can we call it to a, a design overlay or a zoning overlay? Yeah, different. Yeah. So, so it's different. So, so you have PD and PDO just change yeah. the name so there's not a uh, confusion there. Um, I say this, this is great. It's nice to see. It. It's very clear. You're not, you know, trying to figure out well, where am I going to find this information? Having to scan through everything. If it's all right there. Um, I like how every, you know, all the. Um, yeah. Uh, densities and area ratios are in each where they should set, be. Where they should be. But as I said before, is there a way to, we can get a table at, that's at the end so someone that wants to say what's the yeah. difference rather than have to read through the whole thing, they can scan yeah. through. Oh, I can see it. Really. That yeah. I be one of the down the road is that as we work through some of the more what I would call critical aspects to fix problems in our zoning code, normally you'd have all of this in a table. Right. And you would actually have a table yeah. that we, we are well aware that it's just that to do that right now without first doing this, it would be well, very destroyed. You want a table to show the changes, right, is I think what you're also saying. But you're also yeah. looking for a table for the whole thing in the future? I was looking just so you can see what, you know, someone's looking here in this document to say the difference between R1 and R5 or whatever, just to try to figure out, you know, right. if they're looking for, hey, I want to go... I want to buy land right. in oh, okay. Hilton, Got it. but yeah. I want to do this, I, rather than read the whole thing, okay, this looks like I should look in this zoning right but here. Typically you do that and you do it by zone district category, so in right. the counties we did it, all the agricultural dis zone districts, all the residential zone districts, That's and all the commercial. Yeah. 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 And then you can compare them and you can look over right down one, the list which and one see. Here. Yeah. Uh -huh. And it's just like easier to navigate through the so, zone district. We agree. Normally, when yeah, you might get to that piece. You might also go back and look at your zoning districts, and as Councilman Bellard mentioned, you may have zoning districts where you only have a district for one parcel. And a lot of times you would go through and do that, eliminate those zoning districts, and then after you've got your zoning district settled, then you'd go to the table. Mm -hmm. So you don't have necessarily, it, it's an unusual thing to have a zoning district with one parcel. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we're toward the end of our. Pat, Peg, do you have any questions? Patrick? Oh, you will? So do we uh, the, want to move forward with this? Can I have one more follow-up? Mm -hmm. um, the, the land use tables that were done that kind of talked to, stop making fun of me, <laughs> um, that kind of talked a little bit to what Kyle was saying, uh, the work that we did with um, Don Elliott. Don Elliott. So it's, that was for use. So it would look something similar to that? Yeah, I don't know. We'll have to work through what it might exactly look like, but we will take it on and come up we'll with some ideas. Yeah. Typically they have setbacks in them and all the other stuff, so yeah. it says yeah. they're all over the board right now, so we'd have to, we have to look for some of those consistencies. But we've got, we, we have, we're smart when we put our heads together, yeah. so we'll, we'll, get we'll, get we'll get you something that looks like a table that yeah. hopefully is usable. All right. So council, so what is our... Our wishes. We want to go ahead and move forward with this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's unanimous. Also, on the sign uh, work, we would.
didn't ask about that. We want to move forward with that too. Yes, no? Yep. No? Yes. yes. Okay, cool. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Great cool. job. Thank you. So now, yeah. Great work. Thank you. And Jackie um, and our uh, GIS department made all the maps, and I think they were really cool. Uh, how do we get the presentation? It will cost you, and we'll put it um, we'll on tonight. Steve, can I share the proposed signage uh, sandwich board with uh, Littleton Business Chamber? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I think that is. And I was thinking the same thing. I'll highlight it. I was thinking the same thing with the real estate folks, too, because it could have been. Yeah. 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 As well as the downtown um, business group, too. Mm -hmm. right. that, that, yeah, we had yeah, those the three purchase, on sorry, our. The local yeah. purchase. Yeah. 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 We had all three of those on our list to outreach, too. So, so how I'll, we I'll, coordinate. Yeah, I'll address that at the first meeting on Excellent. from Wednesday, I guess. We'll have some community outreach meetings for these two somehow, or, or not outreach. a meeting or some outreach of some sort to get all this out to everyone. Yeah. And we've cleaned it up. And, yes. right. we'll, we'll, we'll use our. We'll use our yeah. All right, I'm going to move down to the uh, updates uh, city attorney. Uh, only uh, one noted event today. Uh, there was an oral argument at the. Uh, Colorado Court of Appeals. Almost said that. Uh, the Colorado Court of Appeals. You've been good, too. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, in the uh, case of Burkett versus the city of Newton. And uh, what happens in an appellate or argument is the lawyers argue, uh, the court takes it under advisement, and then the court will, uh, as they say, in due course. Due course kind of means. Uh, Depending on whether they want to write a full opinion or a short opinion, it can be anywhere from a couple weeks to a couple months. And it all depends on uh, the nature of it. And it, sometimes it can even be longer if you have one of the three judges who wants to write and this is what we call a dissenting opinion, disagreeing with the other two. So um, once I know something, I'll be sending out a longer email. Uh, but right now, uh, the uh, cases under advisement of the three judges, and they normally will meet on Fridays to discuss the cases that they heard during the week. So no doubt on Friday they will be having their uh, judges conference and they'll be discussing this case uh, among the three of them. So as soon as I know something, uh, I will certainly let you know with that. Okay. Is that it? That is it. Thank you. Just a quick update. The council, what was reported is a water main break on Main Street earlier tonight. What happens? It was just a uh, five-eighths inch line that was coming into a business. It was down at the 2600 uh, block of West Main Street. The mixed use project was going in there. Apparently the contractor or somehow the five-eighths line got damaged. So Denver Water was out repairing it earlier. So it wasn't, didn't impact the businesses or residents. Or what traffic? Back to traffic a bit, but that seemed to have calmed in pretty quickly. So they did have one lane block as they tried to fix that. So it should be fixed nice by that. <laughs> yeah. Is that it? That's it. All right. That's all I've got. Reminder, six o'clock Tuesday. That's it. Anything else? No? Good job, Pro Tem. Oh, let's we are finished. Thank you.